In earlier videos, we saw that my biological age, using Dr. Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator as a metric of biological age, is consistently in the 34 to 36 year old age range, which is about 13 years younger than my chronological age. Similarly, when using aging.ai, and with data that goes all the way back to 2009, and with a lot more blood tests, we can see that my biological age range is in the 29 to 32 year range, which is significantly younger than my chronological age during that corresponding time period. So we can see from these two blood-based biomarker uh, biological age calculators that I have a consistently younger biological age. But what's my biological age using epigenetic testing? So with that in mind, I reached out to True Diagnostic and they sent me a couple of kits. And in this video, we're going to go over data for Horvath, Hanum, and Dunedin Pace. So all of those, each of those epigenetic clocks. And if you're interested in measuring your own epigenetic age, I have a discount link from True Diagnostic, uh, and that link will be in the video's description. All right, so as a first, uh, first step, for each of these epigenetic tests, how well do they correlate with chronological age? What's their association with all-cause mortality risk? And then once we've put these data into perspective, what's my own epigenetic data? So first, starting with Horvath's epigenetic test, or more specifically, this is the Intrinsic Epigenetic Age Acceleration, or IEAA, and this is a measure of cell intrinsic aging. So how does Horvath's epigenetic test correlate to uh, co correlate with chronological age, and what's its association with all-cause mortality risk? So first, Horvath's epigenetic clock is strongly correlated with chronological age. In fact, better than every other epigenetic test that exists, and we can see that data here. So on the y-axis, we've got two different iterations of the Horvath clock. On the left, Horvath 1, and on the right, Horvath 2. And we can see it says DNA M age, so DNA methylation age, or epigenetic age. And then that's plotted against chronological age on the x-axis. Now you can see a lot of different colored uh, uh, dots on each of these plots, and each of those uh, colored circles is a uh, different cell type. So this is a multi-cell and multi-tissue clock. And more specifically, we got cells from the from the breast, uh, buccal cells or cheek, brain, cerebe cerebellum, colon, cord blood, uh, dermis or skin, and so on. So it's a multi-cell and tissue clock, and it's looking at the correlation for epigenetic age with chronological age. So for both iterations of the Horvath clock on the left and right, we can see uh, strong correlations with uh, chronological age. And more specifically, when looking at the numbers, we can see that the correlations for Horvath's epigenetic test with chronological age is 0.94 on the left and 0.85 on the right. So very strong correlations for Horvath's epigenetic test with chronological age. And just as a quick note, statistical significance is usually less than uh, a p-value of 0.05. You can see that the p-values for each of these correlations is 1 times 10 to the negative 200. So uh, I, I hate to use the term highly significant, but these are very significant correlations for Horvath, Horvath's epigenetic test with chronological age. All right, what about all-cause mortality risk? So uh, Horvath's IEAA is also significantly associated with, associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And we can see that here. This is a meta-analysis of 13 studies that included more than 13,000 people. And when looking at the meta-analysis hazard ratio and p-value as shown there, we can see that a relatively higher IEAA or a relatively higher Horvath epigenetic age is significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, if there's a weakness in that data, it's that the hazard ratio is very small. So although this is a significant uh, association for a relatively higher IEAA or a relatively higher Horvath epigenetic age, the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality only increases by 1.4%. All right, so with these data in mind, the chronological age and all-cause mortality, what's my Horvath epigenetic age? So I have two, uh, blood, uh, two time points. The first was on May 26th of 2022, and we can see that my intrinsic age, or my Horvath epigenetic age, on the first test was 54.99 years, which is six years older than my chronological age of 49.3 at that time. And then I tested again on July 11th, and again, we can see that my Horvath epigenetic age, 53.52 years, and that's four years older than my chronological age. So we can see an older uh, Horvath epigenetic age relative to my chronological age. Now, to the, so we're off to a bad start. Uh, to add insult to injury, uh, centenarian offspring, so the kids of people who live to older than 100 years or, or longer, centenarian offspring have a lower Horvath epigenetic age, or IEAA, 
when compared with age match controls. And we can see that here. So first looking at IEAA on the y-axis, and then we've got Horvath epigenetic age in centenarian offspring, which is the orange bars, when compared with the age match controls in gray bars. And then we can see for the centenarian offspring that they have a significantly a lower uh, Horvath epigenetic age when compared with the age match controls. So note that I don't have longevity genes. Uh, the longest lived person in my family was uh, to date 95 years. So this may be one possible explanation. All right, so that's the bad news, but there is good news. So let's get into that. And the start of the good news is data for Hanum's Extrinsic Epigenetic Age Acceleration, otherwise known as EEAA. And this is a marker of immune system aging. So first, just like we did for Horvath's test, how is the Hanum epigenetic clock related to chronological age and all-cause mortality risk? So Hanum's epigenetic clock, or EEAA, is significantly correlated with chronological age, and we can see that data here. So again, starting on the y-axis where we've got DNA M age, or DNA, methyl age, uh, DNA methylation age, or more specifically epigenetic age for the Hanum clock, plotted against chronological age. And when using that multi-cell and tissue clock, just like we did or we saw for the Horvath test, we can see a significant correlation for Hanum's clock with chronological age. Now, note that the correlation for the Hanum clock isn't as strong as for the Horvath test. The correlation coefficient is 0.68, but we can again see that very low and statistically significant p-value of 1 times 10 to the negative 200. All right, now, it, uh, Horvath's, uh, sorry, Hanum's test isn't just significantly associated or correlated with chronological age, a relatively higher EEAA or Hanum epigenetic uh, clock test score is significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And we can see that here using that same meta-analysis of 13 studies where we showed data, just showed data for the Horvath test. And when looking at the meta-analysis hazard ratio and p-value as shown there, we can see that a relatively higher Horvath uh, epigenetic uh, age is significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, uh, again, just note that that hazard ratio, although it's a little bit stronger than what we saw for the Horvath test, that's a 2.9% increase for a relatively older Hor uh, Hanum epigenetic age. So let's just keep that in mind as we go forward, as we go forward before we get into the Dunedin PACE uh, data. All right, so now that we've seen how good um, or, or what the data is for chronological age and all-cause mortality for Hanum, what's my Hanum epigenetic age? So on the first test in May, we can see that my Hanum epigenetic age was 36.87 years, which is 12 years younger than my chronological age at that time. And then similarly, uh, before going into the second test, we should note that why this is, is considered an immune system aging metric is because it includes many different immune uh, parameters, including levels of B cells, CD4, CD8, and the ratio between CD4 and CD8 T cells, levels of NK cells or natural killer cells, total levels of lymphocytes, neutrophils, monocytes, and eosinophils. So th those amounts are factored into this metric. It isn't just epigenetic age. It also includes um, the proportions and amounts of, of each of these immune cells. All right, so what about the second test in July? So then relatively consistent data, we can see that my Hanum epigenetic age was 37.47 years, which was again, 12 years younger than my chronological. So from both tests, I've got a 12 year younger Hanum uh, uh, epigenetic age, or EEAA, relative to chronological age. All right, so next up, let's take a look at Dunedin PACE data. So first, what is Dunedin PACE? So this is data derived from the Dunedin study, which is located in New Zealand. And then PACE stands for the pace of aging calculated from the epigenome. So it's a pace of epigenetic aging clock. So just like we did for the Horvath and Hanum tests, how does Dun Dunedin PACE relate it to chronological age? And then how, what's its association with all-cause mortality risk? So here we're looking at the correlation for uh, chronological age with Dunedin PACE data on the y-axis plotted against chronological age. And we're looking at that data for men in blue and women in orange. We can see that Dunedin PACE is significantly correlated with chronological age. More specifically, though, we can see that that correlation is 0.32. And if there's a but, the but is that Horvath's and Hanum's epigenetic tests have stronger correlations with chronological age. And it, just to refresh your memory, remember, both iterations of the Horvath test had correlations uh, with chronological age of 0 0.94 and 0 0.85, which are both higher than Dunedin Pace, and Hanum's was, uh, correlation was 0 0.68. So, so far, Dunedin Pace has a weaker but still significant uh, correlation with chronological age. So where Dunedin Pace shines, it's for is for its association with all-cause mortality risk and its ability to detect the biological age reduction induced by calorie restriction. 
So let's start off with the data for all-cause mortality. And you can see by the title, Dunedin Pace is as good as, good as the best epigenetic clocks for their association with all-cause mortality risk. So first, starting with data from the normative aging study, and this is a study only in men. Uh, no worries though, the second study, Framingham, Framingham offspring, includes both men and women. And then we're look, on the y-axis, we're looking at the mortality effect size. The HR is hazard ratio. So in other words, this is the risk for all-cause mortality on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we've got a head-to-head -head matchup for many epigenetic tests, including Dunedin Pace. The first iteration of Dunedin Pace, uh, which is Dunedin POAM, Pace of Aging Methylation. And we've got Horvath and Hanum epigenetic tests there. And then we can see phenoage, but note that this isn't the blood-based biomarker phenoage metric. This is the DNA methylation or the epigenetic test that was used for phenoage. So phenoage has two tests, the blood-based biomarker test that I commonly report on this channel and a separate DNA methylation or epigenetic age-based phenoage. And then last, head-to-head -head matchup with Grim Age. So first we can see, well, before going into the first, so now, then at a hazard ratio of one, where the confidence interval is either completely above one or completely below one, we've got statistical significance. So when considering that, we can see both the Horvath and Hanum tests, their confidence interval overlaps with one. So they are not significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk in that study, in the normative aging study. In contrast, we can see that both, both iterations of, Dun, uh, of Dunedin, the Dunedin PACE and POAM and PhenoAge and GrimAge epi epigenetic tests were each significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk in this study. So, so far, Dunedin Pace is as good as the best epigenetic clocks in the same ballpark, which in this case would be PhenoAge and GrimAge for their association with all-cause mortality risk. All right, what about in study number two? So this is, the again, the Framingham offspring study, which included both men and women. And in, in this case, we can see that the Horvath test, again, has a uh, confidence interval that overlaps with one. So it was not significantly associated with all-cause mortality risk in this study. But we do see statistical significance for the Hanum epigenetic test and also PhenoAge and GrimAge. You can see that GrimAge at the far right has the largest hazard ratio or, or the largest risk associated with all-cause mortality in this study. But also note that both iterations of the Dunedin epigenetic tests, including Dunedin Pace, are as good as the best epigenetic clocks or in the same ballpark in terms of hazard ratio and being associated with all-cause mortality risk. Now, so if we've just got a, a, an all-cause mortality risk that's similar for Dunedin Pace with all of the, uh, you know, with the best epigenetic clocks, including phenoage and GrimAge, so, so what? We can use either of those four metrics for epigenetic uh, testing. Um, what's special about Dunedin Pace? Well, a younger biological age for people on calorie restriction is identified by Dunedin Pace, but not by epigene other epigenetic clocks. And for this study, this is a study done in people. This is not a study done in mice. This was a two-year randomized control trial, RCT, of calorie restriction. Uh, and more specifically, the average calorie restriction over that two-year period was about 12%. Now, the expectation is that people on CR would have a younger epigenetic age, or DNAM, DNA methylation, when compared with people who could eat as much as they wanted, whenever they wanted, ad lib. And one reason to expect that is because blood biomarker-based biological age improved for people on CR. And I have a video on that. It'll be in the right corner. That's a video from a while back. So if you're interested in that, check it out. All right, so let's get into the, into the data. So here we're looking at changes for Horvath and Hanum for the epigenetic changes on, on calorie restriction for up to two years. And that's what we can see there. So we've got three measures at baseline epigenetic age, epigenetic age after 12 months and 24 months on the diet. And then again, those two groups. So in black, we've got the ad lib, people that ate as much as they wanted, whenever they wanted. And then the calorie, restriction, calorie restricted group in red. Again, about a 12% CR over the two year period. And then we can see that starting from baseline, and this is gonna be the case for each of the six epigenetic clocks I'm gonna show, starting from baseline, there were no differences in epigenetic age for both groups. They started from the same epigenetic age, whether they were in the ad lib or calorie restricted group. All right, so what about changes as a result of being on CR? So for Horvath, we can see that that's not significant. And for those that may think there's some group separation between the 12 and 24 month points for ad lib versus CR, note that the CR group would have a trend, again, not significant though, a trend towards an older epigenetic age using the Horvath test, at least at the 12 month point. But again, this was not statistically significant. And so not, no significant differences for epigenetic age for ad lib versus CR on Horvath. And similarly, you can see that the curves for epigenetic change or the change for epigenetic age using Hanum overlap, not, not significantly different. 
All right, what about phenoage and grimage, which again, were, able, were associated with all-cause mortality risk in both the studies that I just showed. So when looking at both of those clocks and for the change in epigenetic age using them, we can again see no significant differences for either of these clocks for people on CR when compared with ad-lib. Now for the phenoage data, again, it looks like at the 24-month period that people on CR actually had an older epigenetic age. But again, that data was not significantly, uh, significantly different from people on ad-lib, so we can't conclude anything. It's just the, you know, the, the, the line goes that way, but based on the numbers, based on the stats, it's not statistically different. All right, so what about both Dunedin epigenetic uh, age measures? First, starting with the first iteration of the Dunedin PACE study, or, or Dunedin PACE epigenetic test, Dunedin POAM, P-O-A-M on the left. So again, that too, not significantly different. So there were no differences detected for the change in epigenetic age when looking at ad-lib versus CR. But where we do see changes between group uh, changes for the a change in epigenetic age is with Dunedin pace. You can see that ad-lib have a significantly older epigenetic age or change in epigenetic age at both the 12 and 24 month time periods when looking at uh, uh, the differences between ad-lib and CR. So in other words, people on CR were detected to have a younger epigenetic age using Dunedin Pace at both the 12 and 24 month time points when compared with ad lib. All right, so with this in mind and putting the Dunedin Pace data into perspective, what's my Dunedin Pace data? So we can see that here and just going straight to the numbers. So my Dunedin Pace value is 0 0.8. So what does that mean? So on the left, we can see the slowest epigenetic aging rate, which would be 0 0.6. And what that means is for every one year of chronological age, epigenetic age increases by 0.6 years. Conversely, though, the fastest epigenetic aging rate is on the right, and that's 1.4. And that means for every one year of chronological age, epigenetic age increases by 1.4 years. So we can see that my value of 0.8 is on, right, on the right track in terms of relatively slow epigenetic aging. Obviously, I do have some room for improvement as the slowest epigenetic age would be 0 0.6. So 0 0.8, not too far away from that though. All right, now I mentioned that I have two tests. So on the 711 test, we can again see that my Dunedin pace value was 0 0.82. So I've got consistently relatively slower biological age using the Dunedin pace epigenetic age test um, uh, based, based on this data. So that's, again, that's, good news that it's uh, on the right track, but there is some room for improvement to get me to 0 0.6, would be, which would be the slowest epigenetic aging rate. All right, so summary. Uh, so using True Diagnostic, which provided epigenetic age data for the Horvath, Hannum, and True uh, uh, Dunedin Pace uh, uh, epigenetic tests, we saw that I have a relatively older Horvath epigenetic age, and one reason may be is because I, I just don't have longevity genes. But then we saw a relatively low Hanum epigenetic age, which would be indicative of youthful immune cell aging. And then using uh, Dunedin Pace, we saw a relatively slow Dunedin Pace epigenetic aging, or that would be suggestive of a reduced uh, epigenetic aging rate. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And note that there are now discount links, which first, epigenetic testing using True Diagnostic. Uh, again, and all these links will be in the video's description. If you're interested in quantifying your oral microbiome, that will be in the video's description or using Chronometer. Or if you just want to support the channel, you can support the channel with Buy Me A Coffee. All those links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.